Should short stories regain popularity? I don't know, but we're going to talk about some awesome short stories today. And this is a crossover episode. Guys, this isn't just systematic ecology. This isn't just the Whole Church Podcast. If you're listening to this, you're listening to a crossover of two shows on Anazal Ministries Podcast Network, and we're going to be discussing some short stories today. Why are we doing this? Well, one, we're doing this to kind of promote a book fair we'll do next year. Originally, we're thinking January, but we might be postponing that till later in the year. We'll see. We're still going to be doing it, hopefully. And we want to promote literacy. So we're going to do a big event revolving around literature. So we thought we should do an episode that involves some literature. Originally, this was just going to be systematic geekology. But for our whole church listeners, we had a um, we had an interview that not really canceled. It was postponed till next year. And we thought, hey, this actually is a great example of unity that we wanted to share with you guys too. So if you're not following Systematic Geology, you're on the Whole Church Podcast, you have me, a new Lutheran, kind of still Pentecostal. You have a Lutheran pastor, Pastor Will with us. You have TJ, who's just definitely Pentecostal. Christian will be joining us from the Southern Baptist background. And we're going to be talking about some controversial short stories, I would say. Yeah. Some hot topics when we're going through these. So... I think it's really helpful for those who do follow the whole church podcast to see this example of unity and maybe, you know, follow the systematic theology, see what else we're doing over there. I definitely think it's worth a like, a share, and a subscribe. So check it out. Again, I'm Joshua Noel and one of your co-hosts of both the whole church podcast and systematic ecology. Um, only one other person can say the same, and that is the greatest host of any podcast of all time, not of any podcast of all time, but any host of all time, the one and only <laughs> TJ the Dragon. Tiberius one. How's it going, TJ? It, it's going well. That's that's a nickname that hasn't been used in a long time. The dragon? Ooh. Yeah. I mean, you well, want some nickname named Dragon? You, you, TJ, you're I trying to say that up. there was a day when your nickname was Dragon? Yeah, I've been called the Dragon before. I need to know yeah. this story at some point. Maybe not tonight. We got a lot We're of stories to cover, here. but at some point, I, I, I want to know that story. I'll tell you. And the other voice you're hearing right now is the one and only Pastor Will Rose, Will the Thrill, host of the Homily, another show on the Amazon Ministry Podcast Network. Check it out as well. Uh, Mm -hmm. Will, how's it going? Good, good. You know, we have a T-shirt in Systematic Ecology or a mug that says all reading counts. And I think that's what we're getting at here with this episode. Short stories, comic book, novels, novelettes. Uh, audio books, graphic novel, whatever. How do you consume your shores? All reading counts. Literacy is a big part of who we are and what we're doing. And, and so I'm glad to hop into this episode. This is fun. Yeah. Although there is a petition from two of the hosts of Systemic Ecology to remove audiobooks from the shirt and include manga. Manga does count. I also it think does. audiobooks do, but there's a there is a technical um uh, language. It is technically argument. not reading. Yeah. Yeah. But it does count as literacy, and it is just as important and just as beneficial as using your eyeballs to take in the words. Yeah. So with that, let's talk a little bit about what we're geeking out on really quick. Um, Man, uh, this week I've had a a wild week with new Doctor Who coming out and everything else. And um, I almost beat almost platinum all of Kingdom Hearts 2 in like two days, which I didn't even know I could do. But somehow I found the time and I just love that game so much. So, so much. TJ, what you been geeking out on? Uh, Baldur's Gate 3. Mm. New update, yeah, new yeah. difficulty I've heard mode. Things. It's mm. great. Mm. I heard them from you on a different episode, but mm-hmm. I, I have heard good things. Yeah. Will, what, what are you geeking out on lately? Yeah, quick question. Baldur's Gate is uh, D&D? Yep. Fun. Sure is. Um, yeah, I've, I've been... Uh, well, I really geeked out on these stories that that we are reading for this episode, but I haven't watched a yeah. lot of uh, Doctor Who. But now that a, a couple specials are now on Disney Plus, I did watch those two specials and and really Ooh. had a lot of fun with it. It's What'd definitely the second one. I, I man, it's Doctor Who. It's weird. It's it's crazy. It's a <laughs> ride. Um, you know, I don't. I, I love Doctor Who. I, I think it's, it was part of my fandom as a kid, watching it as a kid. But but I haven't watched as of late in the last couple of decades. Uh, but but man, it, that might get me back in into trying to follow what's going on with the new series or what they're going to do with with what's coming up next. But I thought that was a lot of fun. It was definitely Doctor Who. It was mm-hmm. definitely BBC. It was definitely oh, Doctor yeah. Who sci-fi. So man. Yeah, yeah. Right. That, uh, that second special reminded me why I love the series, and uh, mm. it, I think I'm wrestling with it. It might be the third episode of TV ever that I give a 10 out of 10. I really loved it. Ah, but nice. 
we'll be talking about that on what's new soon. So I won't get into it here because this isn't a Doctor Who episode. Rather, we are here to discuss short stories. So let's jump into the episode proper. Mm. Um, and we're going to start with one that's that's pretty interesting. But before we do, um, we're going to start with the Fisher Queen by Lissa Wong, which wasn't any of our pick. We all picked one short story to do. And while we were at Comic Con, I met Alyssa Wong and I asked them for their favorite of their own writing. And they said, here's the one that won an award. And I said, that's not what I want. I don't want the one that won an award. I want to know what's your favorite. And they said, okay, well, check this one out instead. So I did. So we're going to be talking about the Fisher Queen by Alyssa Wong, because that's apparently their favorite of their own stories. I think mm. in all words, but not as many as the other short story that they're more well known for. Check back in. I'm not sure about that. Y'all have to do your own research sometimes. Wikipedia is for a reason. Are there any benefits? This is, this is the question we want to start off with. Do y'all think there are any benefits to short stories that longer form storytelling might not have? Yeah, I'll, I'll hop in it for like, I definitely think it does like this particular challenge to read these short stories to prepare for this episode really helped me um, explore short stories as as of late. And and I think I think there have been people who have told me like, hey, if you can't say it in a 10 minute sermon, if you can't say what you need to say in 10 minutes, you can't say it all. If you can't say it in this amount of time, then you can't say it at all. And there's something about long, long, thick novels of a long drawn out story, but there is something about a short story that can bring into the story super fast, get to what you, it's trying to say um, uh, right, right up front and then leave you impacted at the end. So I, I do think there is something about that. Uh, a short, a good short story has just most impact as a three hour movie or a real super thick novel. So, um, yeah, I think it, it's great. It's an art form for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you, when you're asking someone to devote enough time to read a novel, that's kind of a big commitment and a short story does a lot with the brevity. I think being able yeah. to consume the whole story is is really helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, for sure. As a, as an ADHD person, short stories are way easier. <laughs> See that? Also, that's another reason why I really want audiobooks to count. Just, they're easier. Um, but I, I think for me, one of the big things is like a big novel or like a larger book. I think it has more time to fully flesh out an idea. And in a lot of ways, that is an advantage because you can fully see where the author's coming from, see their perspective, see the other perspective, and a whole story can really wrestle with an idea. And it gives you time to think through, see where the author's coming from, come up with your own opinions, all that. I think short stories don't get that benefit, but instead they have something that novels can't do where it kind of sucks you in really quick and then sucker punches you. And you're just left with uh, trying to figure this out on your own a lot of the time, you know, mm -hmm. um, one that's not going to get included. That's going to be in our follow up. The, uh, the, what was it? The summer one. Why can't I think a summer and I, what am I? All all summer summer and a day. Day. Yeah. All summer and a day. I couldn't remember the title, but yeah, I read that and I was like, now I'm just stuck trying to figure out what I, how I feel about this, what I want to do with this. Whereas if it was a whole novel, they would have fleshed it out more and I probably could have got more closure which is a good thing, but I think sometimes it's good not to have closure, to have a little bit of room to wrestle with the idea of myself, which uh, Christian hates because he hates ambiguity, which is fun to have him on a short story because a lot of short stories involve a lot of ambiguity. <laughs> well, yeah, I happened to pop on as soon as you were talking about short stories uh, not being fleshed out like novels. And when it comes to writing them, I've written very few short stories because they inevitably end up becoming novels. So I've stopped myself from doing that when I already have so many no novels I need to write anyway. So there we are. Yeah, it's an art form. It's definitely an art form. Yeah. Um, for those who don't know, Christian is an author. He has his own books. You can check him out. Uh, maybe he'll give me a link again because I keep forgetting what the link is and I'll put it down below. I know it's like the, the Starving Writers <laughs> Guild dot something. If I just type in starving into my computer, it takes me to the website. But that's because I've been there before. <laughs> you listener may not have. <laughs> but Christian, yeah, we were talking about some of the advantages short stories have over longer form storytelling. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, they do have the ability to tell a more concise story in a shorter amount of time. That's the reason we call them short stories is there's so much we can get done in depending on an author. Like, hey, like we don't need to focus on building up the entire world. Maybe we can leave a little hint of something, especially in like anthologies. I do enjoy that. That may tie into what a writer may do in another short story as well. 
That's why I really love what Stephen King does with his worlds. Like we did have that episode for his cosmology. Uh, was it last month? And if you're paying attention to everything there, you're rewarded as a reader. But other people, they just write stories and they tell something A, B, C, and they're done. And sometimes that's a good way to just read something. Oh yeah, I um, man, if I were doing recommendations, we'll do some later. This won't be my recommendation, but I gotta throw this out there: the A Thousand and One Nights. It's like pseudo religious in Islam. Some it's like it's kind of like apocryphal, not quite like they don't take it as religious, but it does inform a lot of theology and history when you're talking about like Muslim belief. But uh, man, it, it's just if you're looking at it just as stories, wow, those are incredible short stories that all tie together to tell an overarching narrative. So if you just love short stories, um, yeah, you should read that. It's just definitely worth it. Also, Aladdin's way cooler in the book. <laughs> <laughs> and was not part of the original canon of the uh, somewhat apocryphal, right? So it's like non-canon for the non-canon. It's like super non-canon, but it's still good. I think, but I, I do think there's a gift. If, you know, we've all been around people who have told stories and you're like, oh man, get to the point. Where, why are you telling me this? Why are you doing this? Why is this going on and on and on? Not that Joshua ever does that, but I'm like, hey, come on. <laughs> what, are, what, are, what are we doing? But I, I think there's something to say like, man, you get to the point, you know what you're trying to say, boom, you make it. And then it has an impact and it sits with you for a long time. Each one of these stories that we yeah. read really sat with me for a long time and they didn't use a lot of words or a lot of pages to do it. They, they, condensed what wow. they were trying to say in the parable that they were trying to say or, or image and boom. Um, TJ's pick did kind of use a lot of pages to do it. <laughs> yeah. We'll get yeah, there were a lot of pictures that. though. Yeah. 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 Graphic yeah. novels, graphic novels. Yeah. I, I can't tell if TJ's muted or not. I can't either, but we're going to move on till we can hear him. Only but, half of those pages have words. It's a short story. Yeah. Yeah. True. I suppose <laughs> if you want to call it that, whatever um i can't stop you officially anyway um so let's go ahead let's start with the fisher queen uh it's the yeah. one we mentioned Alyssa wong recommended when we were at comic con and i asked them which story do they like the most i gave them the the idea for this episode i was like here's what we're doing what do you think and again you know so they they told us their most popular book i don't, I don't care what other people like i don't know what you like this is what they suggested um so I want my, my first question for you guys is, uh, you know, we all read all of these and I think this is might be the first time any of us have read this one. Um, why do you think they chose this as the one they would want us to read for this? Anybody have any like just ideas of why they would have picked this one? I'll I'll jump in because I was a part of that conversation. Um, and just Alyssa's background is that um, they were a creative writing major at NC State here in North Carolina, went off to write video games and short stories and eventually got into writing for Marvel. So that's kind of the connection there at North Carolina Comic Con. And I um, I, I, I think Alyssa's love of horror, body horror, and as Alyssa described kind of what it means to be in a body or embodiment along with that, I think really captured what what they want to express in terms of this story and really pushing the limits of how we see ourselves and and what we do in the environment and animals. So uh, yeah, this one haunted me too. Um, if you, again, mermaids, but we're not talking the little mermaid from Disney. We're not talking about mermaids like cartoon characters. This is a different kind of mermaid in this book for sure. Yeah. I, I feel like uh, reading it, I, it feels very personal. I can see how they would have put a lot of themselves into the book and how it can be a reflection of how women are treated and have to experience the world today. And it, I feel like I have no place to speak on it because I am not a woman or a fisherman. Yeah. I felt that way about the first two stories we're going to talk about. And I was like, yeah, we're still including these because they, they, even though it's uncomfortable because we don't really have a place, we don't experience the same things to say, whether this is valid or not. I don't think we have room to comment on that, nor are we going to try to um, rather no, I, I think it as a story. And I want to see what do we do? do with this because I, I don't think that they wrote this in mind for only other women to be like yeah that's what i experienced i think they wrote this in mind for a general audience to read this and struggle with what is reality and what are we wrestling with here um 
Yeah, so let's let's break it down. Christian, would you mind kind of giving us a summary of what this story was and kind of just a basis of the plot? I was struggling to remember this, so I'm not the to ask. I read it the meet it design the minute we did this, so I haven't looked at it since then. I mm. apologize. Mm. All right. Uh then I'll I'll try. So the story starts off with the girl being really good at swimming and 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 transparency. I'm just a positive person, so I want to assume every story is going to be positive. So I was like, okay, cool, cute little story. Girl's like, oh, happy. She's a good swimmer. And, you know, there's a myth that her mom was a mermaid. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cute. You know, whatever. Um, she grows up and wants to go on this fishing trip with them. And it turns out there are mermaids and they're not at all like what we think of. Like, even the way that they're physically described to me was kind of unnerving. Like, oh, that's a, okay, more like one piece fishermen like fish people but if they were real which meant they would be creepy as crap like they're creepy looking and sounding and everything you get into the story and you find out in the end that uh people have been abusing the fish people and still eating them so they've been sexually abused they're getting eaten as food because they're basically fish they're just really tasty fish because they're part human which is also disturbing on a few different levels. Long story short, um, basically short a wish comes true that anyone who, a short story told short, <laughs> but uh, anyone who was um, more or less guilty of assault was going to die and their dad and every, basically every man in this town dies. And it's just kind of a disturbing, oh, this is assault. This is what it's like that how we treat animals. You know, I, I think it's into a, the question of whether or not we should be vegan, if we should be, you know, <laughs> farming or how we treat our livestock, food, whatever. I think it gets into that, but it more gets into the are women just being treated like property? Are women being treated just like animals? And um, what are we doing in our culture? And what are we justifying? You know, they justify this as, oh, it's only men out on a ship for so long. And eventually things start looking desirable, even this disturbing looking fish person. And you're like, oh, yeah, we do a lot of this kind of justification for some terrible stuff. And um, I don't know, there's a, there's a lot to wrestle with. Will, pastor us through this. What, what yeah, are your yeah, thoughts? Yeah. What, what did you take from this? Well, well, I think the first sentence hooks you. My mother was a fish. And, and you're like, okay, what, what does that mean? And, and so there's this town, there's this, uh, fishing community and, and they have, I, I think they even go into like these levels of consciousness when it comes to the mermaids themselves, you have the low mermaids, they're like, uh, mud dwellers and you get all the way to this one mermaid that they catch. Um, they bring on there that maybe can communicate and not just make sounds, but actually use words to communic communicate or even, uh, uh, use magic or curses there there's this kind of aura around this particular one mermaid that they catch that she is uh the main character is trying to go and, and hang out with so yeah eventually they are cursed it's a, it has like a stephen king as kind of curse everyone dies at the end because of what they've done justice is brought to because of how they treated these particular mermaids in particular this one and and yeah there's sexual assault there's um uh the mermaids are a delicacy and um, uh, are charged more to buy because uh, they're considered delicacy in this particular world. And yeah, they're not the cute mermaid that you think of from, um, you know, Peter Pan or, or the little mermaid, but uh, it's a whole different world, but it does, it, it, it does force you to challenge to lean into how you look at other things as property and even people and even women. But I also, it, I think, what's our connection to the animal kingdom and are we that separate from other animals because we're humans and have consciousness or whatever, or yeah, it challenges you to look at other animals and whether you're connected to them in a way or not as well. So, so yeah, yeah. I think it, it's, it's a challenging, it's a, it's a horror book, it's a semi horror book. It's, it pushes some yeah. things, but also ask some deeper questions, which again, a short mm -hmm. story. Um, I think for me, the, I think the thing that disturbed me or challenged me the most was to think about the um, the father in the story because mm. he justifies all a lot. And he even he's hiding this stuff from his daughter of what sailors are doing to these fish people, because in his mind, hiding it is going to protect her. And this mm -hmm. whole time, she thinks it's just some myth that her dad's being silly and he's just being sensitive about their mom and that her mom obviously just ran away. Her mom couldn't be a fish person um, or mermaid. 
then she learns the truth and he keeps trying to just go, no, 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 act like you didn't see it. Go upstairs, hide. And it's like, oh man. And I mean, you know, when I think of some of the stuff that's come out in different parts of the church this last year, hmm. that's not far from reality. Like that is exactly how hmm. we treat this stuff. And it's like, oh, that's disgusting. Yep. Um, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If that's how you feel. If you read this and you feel disgusted, then that's, a, I think, the correct re um, response <laughs> to it. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I'm glad yeah. you feel that way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to save you like... from that. I'm not going to save you from that or wave yeah. my magic wand and say you shouldn't. Yes, I'm glad you did. And, and that should challenge <laughs> us to how we feel about other issues in the world as well. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Much like another story on this list, like it does tie in a bit to mythology to an extent. I don't know if this was what she had going in mind. But there are plenty of old legends from across the world. I think of like uh, Selkies are a big one in like British mythology of the idea of, well, you just capture their skin. Uh, the Selkies are kind of like this seal mermaid kind of thing. And you can make one or get a mermaid from the sea and you take them from the sea. You can make one your wife. It's like, well, uh, it's kind of a very terrible thing to do. You're taking someone you see as less already especially in these older mythologies of women not having the representation they necessarily would have now and say, well, I'm the man I can do it. Whatever I do is okay to bring them to this point. And we'll get to Galatea in a moment here. It's kind of a similar premise. Like in the original Greek myth, they go, Oh, okay, that's fine. But then when you start thinking about it more critically, you go, wait a minute. No, I don't know about that. If everyone's being as free as they want to be in this scenario. Mm hmm. I will say a couple things, uh, not about the message or anything. Uh, I just really like the world building in this. It, you know, it's a short mm -hmm. story. It's hard to get that in there. But it's a really interesting world where mermaids yes. just definitely exist and different varieties of them. And they've built this industry around transporting mermaids, which is basically just you put mermaids in the bilge of your ship and you go in there. Uh, but that's cool. It's cool world building. It's an awful atrocity. Yeah. Uh, but it's cool world building, and it mimics a little bit the the shark trade of today. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I didn't think about that, but yeah, definitely. Mm. Or mm -hmm. or or porpoise orcas orcas mm -hmm. in captivity mm -hmm. as entertainment. Uh, porpoises and dolphins as entertainment in in certain um, locations. Yeah, yeah, it, it mirrors that for sure. Mm. Although you know, we all know that I disagree with a lot of people on a uh, certain theme parks when it comes to that, but that's because you know. AZA accreditation and all the atrocities that happen if we don't do some of this stuff. But you know, that's whatever. That's a different conversation for a different time. Yeah, I'm talking about people eating um, them. Yeah, that, that's bad. <laughs> that's just unequivocally bad. Um, I, I Man, we are 25 minutes in. We have other stories to talk about. So let's go ahead do and it. rate this one. Zero to ten. Oh, man. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm rating it as a story, this is what I'm going to try to do. Not the message. Because the message... Man, that it shook me to my core. I'd have to give it a 10 if I was doing I'd have to give it 11 out of 10 if I was doing the message. Um, just doing the story. I'm going to go with an 8. It was great. It was awesome. It wasn't my favorite short story I've ever read, but man, it did challenge me. So I'll go with an 8. Um, Will, let's do you next. So you're to 10. Yeah. Uh, nine for me. It, it flowed. I couldn't put it down. Uh, I read it all in one sitting. It wasn't like I was like, oh, I'll read a couple pages. I'll come back to it. Whatever. They're short stories. You should be able to sit, read them all in one sitting anyway. But, you know. Um, oh yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. But but yeah, uh, nine nine for me. Yeah. It, it hooked yeah. me. Couldn't put it down. Couldn't stop thinking about it. After oh. meeting Alyssa, hearing them talk on Ryan Doe's podcast, and then reading some of the comics I got from them, I I'm now that's what I'm geeking out on. I'm reading everything by Alyssa Wong. I'm hoping to get for Christmas their Iron Fist because I I'm just so intrigued by their writing just in general. TJ zero to ten. What are you rating this one? Uh, I. I'd probably give it like a nine and a half. I really like the message. Uh, I really like the world and it's cruel. It's harsh. It's almost a coming of age story. I could probably talk about this a lot longer, uh, mm -hmm. but I won't. Yeah. Each of these <laughs> could be their own episode. So if you guys want, please let us know. We'll do an episode on any of these. We are not yeah. afraid to revisit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Christian. Well, I'm glad you said an eight because I was afraid I'd be five. So. Now I can say I'm not the most critical. Hmm. All right. That, that That's, yeah, that's pretty entertaining. All right, so let's go on to our next story that we're going to be discussing. Um, this one was actually my pick. Oddly enough, we have Madeline Miller's Galatea. I, I came across this one actually just because 
I was in Barnes and Noble just picking up some some books for, you know, I now I work some nights and we were getting some books for my wife. So she'd have something to do while I was at work. And then I saw this little hardcover. I was like, man, that would look interesting on my bookshelf. That was really my thought was this would look interesting on my bookshelf. And I picked it up and then I read it and I was like, (laughs) I might order everything Madeline Miller has ever written. I am just enthralled by this. It's just what it was so good. So challenging. Also creepy, also disturbing. Not in a horror way this time, but definitely disturbing. Maybe a horror? I I wouldn't consider it horror. It wasn't scary. Horror doesn't have to be scary. It should be terrifying things that occur in the world. Mm. Uh, Yeah. Mm. I don't know. This one would be iffier if I would want to call it horror. But anyway, that's not the point. The point was it was disturbing. It was very interesting, challenging. Um... Yeah, I, I chose it because this was the first, the most recent st- short story I read that got me on a whole kick. I've been reading a lot of short stories and picking up some omnibuses and different stuff and just reading through. And man, um, the way that this took an old Greek story, retold it, which I didn't know that story, which is why I might have Christian do the summarizing because I didn't know the story this was retelling. I just was reading it for itself and going, oh, oh. Um, <laughs> the, yeah, the story is uh, the story of Galatea, but from the statue's perspective of someone creating their perfect woman, them coming to life and how they were treated, misused, abused. Um, man, this was I think this would be a tragedy, a Greek tragedy, I guess, technically. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, Christian, could you actually could you summarize this one for us? What? And yeah, sure. Just let us know your original thoughts, because I, I am very intrigued. Okay, um, this is based off of the Greek myth of Galatea being brought into life by Pygmalion, uh, who, in that myth, like he had never found like a wife for himself, so he made one, asked for, uh, who was it exactly? One of the goddesses gives her Aphrodite. life. Aphrodite. Uh, thank you. Uh, gives the statue life. They become a married couple, happily ever after. Blah blah blah. But for this one, we get more of a slightly more modern take in that she is being looked at by all these doctors say you're not acting well all this stuff like you should like be more happy about your surroundings you have a daughter right I, I, i'm not misremembering for this correct you yeah. have a daughter yeah, right. yeah and it's her suffering from the fact that she was given life and the first thing is that she is now a part of this uh married to this man essentially has not had a will of her own for the most part and is expected to go through all these you know, uh, wifely duties without ever like experiencing life on her own manages to escape for a bit. And then we go full awakening, uh, where she decides to get rid of life as it were. Yeah. Yeah. Well, not just for herself. Um, yes. And, uh, the, the most disturbing thing in all of this to me. So the man keeps revisiting and trying to see if she's well, and basically by well, it means is she acting the way he wants her to act? Cause if she's not, then obviously she's sick because he's, her creation. So this also gets into questions of how do we relate to our creator? It gets into question of what does it mean to be alive? You know, the image of God kind of stuff. I feel like is as a Christian is something I'm wrestling with when I'm reading this. Um, there, there's a lot of stuff that really was challenging, but mostly it was this idea of women. And I am thought of the uh, purity culture that we deal with in the church today of how, you know, we expect women have to dress a certain way so that they're not enticing men, all this kind of stuff. And uh, especially because I had to do some research on the on the story, and, and it was a lot of the stuff was the guy when he made his perfect woman didn't like how women were, you know, acting promiscuous or dressing certain ways and the kind of stuff. So he formed his perfect woman who was more, you know, whatever. And it's like, oh, that's yeah, that's not OK, actually. And the thing that disturbed me the most, though, was um, since she had a child, she had, you know, marks on her belly from that stretch marks. And he said, yeah, if you were still a statue, I could shivel those away, those imperfections. And I was like, oh. Hmm. Oh man, yeah, that that really disturbed me. I was like, oh man. Um, TJ, what, what were your thoughts on this one? I think it's really interesting to see, uh, like a story that I've seen before from such a different perspective, that is modernized as well as Galatea is. Uh, I think it's a much more realistic portrayal of Pygmalion, uh, just because this is how it would really go, and you know seeing as the statue was transformed into a woman, of course, came with sentience and their own thoughts and desires and wants. Uh, and I th- it's done really well. Madeline Miller is someone I might have to read more of because of this. 
and it, it's great. It's not only a, a good representation of what spousal abuse can look like, but parental, uh, religious. It's if someone wants you to fit into a mold that you don't want to fit into, uh, Galatea might be a, a short story you should check out. Oh yeah, yeah, and li literal mold even, and and it's mm -hmm. just kind of a. On, also, it, it it really opens up this um this challenge, especially for married peoples, of yeah, just because you want something and that you're married doesn't mean you get to demand this thing. Like it was like, oh yeah, that's yeah, it was portrayed in such a disturbing way. Um, Pastor Will, the one who has been married the longest out of all of us, and who is a yeah. pastor? Would you you care to give us some commentary on this one? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I knew from the get go. I'm not telling Cindy what to do. That's uh, that's uh, <laughs> cheating on personal. And I knew that. Yeah, yeah, I know that feeling. <laughs> you know that. Um, but but no, I think Madeline Miller is um, like her background is is a Latin and Greek um, kind of scholar and expert, and she's rewritten some of these stories and from a modern point of view, and and she's lifted up and said in, in interviews that these Greek myths, you know, really do shine light on universal human experiences, and whether they're from ancient times, thousands and thousands, thousands of years ago, if they still capture what people go through and kind of expectations and pressures and uh, wants and desires. Um, uh, the the human the universal understanding of the human condition and our brokenness and those kinds of things so they they tap into shed light on on that truth um, that we all experience and so yeah this was another um, I don't know if you guys have seen the old 80s movie Weird Science anybody anybody out there mm -hmm. yeah, yeah there you go uh, there's another one called Mannequin you know um, out there where I've Mannequin that comes to life <laughs> yeah yeah so, uh, way so worse. when I'm reading this story there's Doctor Who that kind of spent off that but um, yeah. Yeah, That's yeah. Another, so another time. this idea of creating who you think your perfect person or ideal partner or friend or wife or who you lust over is going to be. And then when they come to life, they have their own sentience and their own free will and they are their own person and, and not seeing them again as an object, but as their own person. I think that that this story captures some of that again. So again, yeah, the ending of, um, you know, what, what do stones and statues and marbles do when they're put in the water, they sink. And so where is she going to find eternal sleep? Where is she going to find peace and escape? You know, it does get into, uh, you know, mm -hmm. that whole idea of understanding of, um, yeah, trigger word of, of suicide or, or taking one's own mm -hmm. life or where do you find peace? Do you feel like there's no way out? How do you get freedom? How do you experience that or not? Those, those are real questions mm -hmm. that people wrestle with that I think, um, therapy and counselors and community and, and pastors and friendships can, can help with that and holding people accountable, but also helping people work through some really hard times and difficult questions. So, um, yeah, this, this, this definitely has some phrases and words and situations. You're like, Oh, wow. And I will say the story of Achilles, I think is one of her books and, and Circe, is that one mm -hmm. of them? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. My daughter oh, my read those books. Reading this. Yeah, my my daughter read those books and they and they love them. So they're like, man, mm -hmm. that's right. And when they saw this short story sitting on on my desk, they're like, what you're reading that? And I'm like, yeah, first it's Mikey Gouge. Mm -hmm. They're very impressed. They're like, cool, you're reading yeah, cool. Yeah. That's cool. Oh, yeah. That. yeah, no, yeah, no, it, it was yeah. Re really good read, really interesting stuff. Um, also, uh, I think that I don't want to skip over that I thought was really important. The author also kind of points out how obviously the abused is in a toxic relationship, but it also shows how the abuser was kind of also had this toxic thing going on where it, it controlled his life. It took him over. It tortured him in a way, even though he was doing the torturing, he was a bad guy. I'm not trying to say he was not a bad guy. Um, but even to the end where his inability to let go kind of cost him his life too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So exactly. Yeah. yeah. I thought that was really good. All right, real quick, zero to 10. Where are we at? um i'll start since this was my pick uh yeah man i you know guys you know i don't like doing this but uh when i rate i compare to other things i'm thinking of short stories i think this might be my favorite short story i've read it recently so it could be recently biasy so i might change this later on i reserve the right to change my mind but i'm going 10 out of 10 i i loved it it was great um tj seven all right will I'm going to go seven as well. The message is good, but in terms of the flow and the way it captured along the way, uh, the other books, other stories we read, uh, I'll, I'll give it a seven. Not that it's not yeah. good. Um, the yeah, message is important, true. but but seven. Yeah. I, just I think also this, like the setting a lot. Yeah. This probably would benefit the most from not being a short story. Mm, disagree. Christian. I would second that. Seven, five. Yeah, I mean, I'm I am really because Josh with the wrong opinions. So no, 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 I'm not saying you're not wrong to have that opinion this time, this one time, Joshua. But 
I mean, it's told really well, but like, there's definitely a lot of stuff that could have been expanded on more here. And it's not this short story's fault, but it, like I said, it reminded me of The Awakening, which is I despise that book so much. It mm, is it, what this what The Awakening tried to do. This succeeded at. I'll put it that way. Uh, hmm. Yeah, I like that take. That's that's a generous take. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's jump to our next one: A Sound of Thunder. Um, oh, by Ray man. Bradbury. Also, I love how they did his name for this. this that that looks cool. Um, all- Pastor Will, this was yours. Let's let's have you take over a little bit. Um, Why did you choose this one? Tell us a little bit about the story, the summer, right, plot, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I chose this one because it's, it really is one of my favorite stories of all time. And when you're and when you said pick a pick a short story to read, I immediately thought The Sound of Thunder. I think about this one a lot, not only because it has a little bit of it has some sci fi flair and time machine and dinosaurs and all those kind of fandom things that I like with systematic ecology. But in terms of what this story captured and what was going along and the way he uses language and imagery and similes and metaphors to describe these this world and what's going on and also our present day um, political situation and what could happen or not happen with certain choices we make or not i was like man this is it so i love ray bradbury i i think what he does is great the other story that we're going to use for another bonus episode later on i was the first time i read that story and the imagery and the words he used to capture an image in your head it's just um he's the goat man he's the goat i think yeah. when it comes to short yeah. stories i yeah, agree our follow-up our follow-up episode uh, all, all summer's day and um, we have a guest for that. And man, I did love that short story. I'm upset I won't be there for that one. But uh, I love both of these. These were both really good picks. Yep. Um, yeah, TJ, you were going to say something about this. Oh, two things. It's all summer in a day. Because Josh, I don't think has ever gotten the name Thank right you. for that short story. I can't get a name right for most things. <laughs> it has to be like one word. Yeah. 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 Uh, but I love this. This is a, a great, fantastic the perils of time travel story. Uh, I love how methodical the company is about like, no, trust us. It's safe. You can kill this dinosaur as long as you kill it exactly when we tell you to, because that's when it was supposed to die. We're, we're killing it right before <laughs> it was supposed to die. It's okay if you kill this one dinosaur. Don't do anything else. Don't step off the plane. Don't touch any grass. Don't kill a butterfly. None of it. <laughs> and I love the way the story is told, because I think this was mostly written as a, kind of like a, a short comedy mostly uh, and mm-hmm. then ray in the way ray does found a way to fill it with actual lessons to learn uh and <laughs> a, a pretty good portrayal of i would say anxiety because mm-hmm. our main character knows what he's doing is safe until he starts thinking about it it's like oh but what if and that's kind of where it spirals uh ah, also my favorite probably like consequence of uh or result of the butterfly effect i guess uh mm-hmm. because, i don't know do i want to spoil it I've, everyone should read this it's short it's a short story yes yeah 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 go for it spoil it's over uh, 20 years old you can spoil it i'm about to spoil some doctor who stuff that just happened <laughs> yeah well you're wrong for that uh yeah, they get back to modern day and mm-hmm. from what we can tell, what it reads to us is basically just that um, uh, all the spelling is bad. <laughs> language even changed. The yes. Language even changed. How we even communicate or the letters we use to spell words change because of this one's person's actions, what happened. Uh, maybe, yeah, let me, let, a, a short, short summary of the book. And we will, so Eccles uh, spends $10,000, which is like $100,000 in today's um. Uh, money because Ray wrote this in 1952. Uh, Eccles um, pays $10,000 to hop on Time Safari Inc. to go back and he's a big game hunter. And so instead of shooting a a, a lion or a giraffe or whatever, he's going to go back and shoot a T-Rex. And and that's what they go back to do. But there are rules with this because of time travel and they're doing this underneath kind of government regulation because they know the consequences that if you change something in the past, it's going to change the future. And so there's all these different rules that goes in, into this and uh, they go back to prehistoric time way, way back uh, um, millions of years ago and they, they shoot T-Rex. They see a T-Rex. How the T-Rex emerges and what they see and how he describes it, um, man, just go back and read the language he uses uh, to describe 
the certain situation and what happens when it, there's a sound of thumb or thunder or not. Um, and so, uh, this guy Eccles does freak out and he does step off the path and they think that, that he just stepped on some mud and got some mud on his shoe. That's going to get him in trouble when they go back. Uh, but when they go back and, and go back to 2055, uh, where, where they originated from, um, the, the a different person had won the presidential election and now language is different. And now there's going to be a tyrant and dictator rather than someone who's like celebrates freedom all because oops, he looks on the bottom of the shoe. He stepped on a butterfly. So you have this butterfly effect. And, and so you looked at the butterfly effect is a butterfly effect is a word or a phrase we use coined I think by like a, um, a weatherman, like a physicist in like the sixties, I think. Right. Uh, I don't know the word, but uh, like if a butterfly flaps his wings in Brazil, does that create a tornado in Texas? Is that what they were doing? But it is also played after what this story was happening. You think about what Ray Bradbury is doing here before um, a lot of big, um, you know, um, I guess advances in science or understanding physics, but also the other story, how we, we hadn't been to the moon yet. We hadn't seen pleasant planets up close yet. So we do a lot of speculation when it comes to science fiction, but, but this whole idea that our actions have consequences, no matter what the choices yeah. we make. And, and what I think about is my dad, you know, he, uh, he, when he was walking around North Carolina after college, after fighting the Vietnam War, he, he ran into um, an old fraternity brother. And they're like, oh, you should apply for this job at this bank I work at. And he's like, sure. Oh, cool. I'll do that. Well, that leads him to work for this bank that eventually moves uh, to Asheville or goes to Charlotte where he meets my mom. Then he moves to Asheville. And then that bank moves him to Wilmington where I grew up. So this whole thing, if he hadn't run into this old fraternity guy and gotten this job, would I be around? What would the whole life be like? So those kinds of things that unfold is fascinating to me that Ray is getting into, Ray Bradbury is getting into, into this story. So I, I think about it all the time, the choices we make. I don't think we should be paralyzed by them. There's a certain freedom um, in those things, but I do think our, our actions have consequences, and that's what it's getting at in this in this story. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I do really it, like that message. It was Edward Lawrence uh, for the butterfly effect, which right. is – you know, related to chaos theory and why he yep. the meteorologist said you can't really predict the weather uh but he did attribute it to the sound of thunder yeah because his original analogy was a seagull and a storm and he was convinced to change it to the butterfly yeah because uh -huh. that's that's cool. pretty cool yeah good stuff good stuff um yeah i, I do really like the uh Actions have consequences. Uh, just shout out to another show on the AMP network. Um, the Bible After Hours with the Foul Mouth Preacher. It's, uh, he's been going through judges, and that's been a big thing that they're going through is um, actions have consequences. Of course, I think he says it as uh, what you F up gets F'd up. So, yeah. <laughs> actions <laughs> have consequences. Wait. I like that better. Christian, <laughs> um, what are your thoughts? Have you read this before? Um, yes. Are you familiar with this story? What are your thoughts on this as someone who's a sci-fi writer and fantasy writer and um, loves this genre too. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I first read this in high school and fell in love with it. It's a, such a great idea. It's the quintessential time travel story in the mm -hmm. idea of what our actions in the past, could we change the past? And what happens as a result of that? Like, can I go back, step on a butterfly and oh no, suddenly English is different. Now this tyrant is in charge of America. Or do I go back and what happens if I accidentally kill my grandfather? Or if you're Philip J. Fry, you actually become your own grandfather. Like, how does this, what happens as a result of this? The Great questions reference. we need to, yeah, <laughs> thank you. The, the kind of questions we need to ask if this were to become attainable, does a branching timeline get created? Do we go full, you know, uh, Loki with this right now? Is there a mm -hmm. sacred timeline out there? Would God himself yeah. intervene to prevent something like this from happening because there is only one timeline or are there multiple? Does he allow for multiple realities? How does this go? And it comes from the simple question of, well, what happens if we go back? And I do this. Mm -hmm. And it's so well done that yeah. this story is timeless. Uh, no pun intended because yeah. of that. Yeah. yeah. I, Since I this think is releasing. Also, sorry. One more, one more thing. There's a part in the book where he describes why it's important not to change things. Like uh, if you give a mouse a cookie kind of thing, the children's <laughs> book, same thing. Like what if you kill this mouse? Well, then this one person will eat the mouse and then this whole uh what it, this whole like species is going to starve because this one um, mouse dies mm -hmm. and then eventually you get to be like the way that outline what this happens. He describes in the book and only a couple of paragraphs because it's a short story um, is, is just brilliant. Sorry, Joshua, go ahead. Now, I was going to say for, for those listening on a whole church and uh, 
these guys have not heard last week's episode yet. This does mark two weeks in a row where Loki, the storyline from Loki has become very relevant to our conversation. <laughs> yes. <that's laughs> um, which funny. But uh, yeah, let's go ahead and let's wrap this one up. Uh, rating zero to ten. Um, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and become the sore here and start off with being Josh with the wrong opinions because that's what I do. Um, I'm going to give it a five. Uh, if I'm just thinking of all the short stories I've read, it's just in the middle. <laughs> Pretty average for me. I, I, um, I think it's my fault because this is the first time I've read it. And um, it just felt like something I've, I've read before over and over. It's overdone for me. But it's just my fault for this being just now when I came to it. Yeah. Joshua, you are a constant reminder that Jesus died for you and I have to love you. <laughs> I? This was the first one. All right, TJ. Yeah, but it, for me, you know, this I've, is like read, my, my, I've had one this story of my friends, so many times. Phineas and Ferb did friends, it better. One of my friends listened to 808s and Heartbreaks by Kanye West and then was like, I just don't see how it's that influential. That's because you listened to it in 2023. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's my yeah, fault. The music the great just point, sounds DJ. like that now. It, it <laughs> is my fault, but it is what it is. That's my experience. Yeah. <laughs> you can take it away yeah, from TJ. Go ahead. Oh, no. uh, eight and a half. I like this. I love this. <laughs> All right. Uh, Pastor Will. Oh, 10 for me. Uh, yeah. I picked it. I think about it all the time. 10, 10, 10. Christian, you with me? 10? I'll second that. It's a 10 out of 10. Yeah, and wow. you know, we uh, see all the time here on Let's Make Geology. We don't have to all agree, you know, so that's yep. fine. We'll have a no, no geek shaming, but but man, we oh. can shake our head in disbelief. I can't time. wait to disagree with Christian about the next big. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which, I'm a rating. Christian's pick, uh, Bell and the Dragon. Christian, yeah. why'd you pick it? And you go ahead and uh, give a summary of this one for us, please. Uh, why did I pick it? Is with was in the public domain, and anyone could look at it for free, and I wouldn't have to spend money on it. Uh, but also <laughs> because it's a possibility of like, what if this was actually a story in the Bible? What if this was an apocryphal? And that I know some, uh, so you'll find it in some Catholic Bibles, you'll find it in some Orthodox Bibles, but for the most it's written beyond where the rest of Daniel that we have has been written. So this appears to be fan fiction of some sort, which got to say pretty cool fan fiction, but Bell and the Dragon, why did I choose it? Well, because I wanted to be a little different than everyone else. I was going to do a Stephen King short story there, but I couldn't choose between them. So I decided just to do Bell and the Dragon, which would be chapter 14 of Daniel, I think, if it was in the Bible. It would have been placed after chapters or actually probably between four and five, I think. So it probably would be chapter five, but it would make the book of Daniel longer. Yes. So just as a summary, there's three different things that happen in this story. Um, the first one is we have Bell is being worshipped in, you know, the region of uh, Babylon uh, slash Persia. I can't remember. Yeah, no, this is Persia at this point in time. And the king comes up to Daniel and says, hey, you know, what about my cool living God, Bell, here? Don't you see how every day food is brought to him and he eats it? And Daniel's like, yeah, he ain't God. Uh, he's not doing this. So what happens is we have our first locked room mystery in all of history which is another reason why I picked this uh, so because good. that's such a big part of the detective genre and like, Hey, this food is brought in there. The doors are closed. No one can get in. The seals are on the doors to make sure no one breaks in during the night. How does the food get eaten? Well, obviously it's because the God is real, right? Well, no, Daniel being a very smart man puts down this ashy kind of substance on the floor and come to find out the priests who worship bell are bringing their families in during the night through a secret room that doesn't break the seal of the original door, but they go in there, eat the food and then say that the God did it instead. And when the King finds out about this, he puts them all to death because this is still that part of history <laughs> and they died. Now the second part is Daniel with the dragon. So the King is like, okay, well you got me with the last one, but what about bell? Excuse me, this dragon right here, he's a living, breathing thing. We can see him eat. And Daniel's like bet and comes in and says, all right, we're going to make this special pitchy kind of substance here make it eat it and the dragon's going to explode from the inside and it dies so it's oh yeah that's your living god right there how about you worship the actual god and there we go uh the third part is basically him in another lion's den situation and god brings habakkuk One. over there and there we go i think it's supposed to be the same lion's den that's why i think it would be placed um also i had that wrong it would be between five and six not four and five if my thinking is correct 
because that's also when he was in Persia, all that other stuff. Um, hey, do you mind if I, I go ahead and uh, I'm going to break down the stuff that uh, Christian's not going to like that I have to say about it. <laughs> yeah, for um, I think the book of Daniel was put together by a redactor. Um, I think all of Daniel was just random short stories, the first half that were put together to reflect. If you look at it, they each part of the stories reflect and parallel the different parts of the prophecy in the second half of the book of Daniel. I think that is the only reason this gets excluded because if it was included, you wouldn't have the perfect parallel and the book of Daniel as a whole would be a worse piece of literature. Just thinking of it just purely as literature. Yeah, if you want it to parallel, you can't have the story in there. But this is an interesting story. So I, I could see where it was taken out. I also could see where it would have been included in another world um, because it does. It pairs very well with the rest of the message of Daniel. Um, if you pay attention to the book of Daniel, uh, I don't think Daniel's meant to be a real person. Uh, I think he's symbolic of the Messiah to come, which is why he lives way longer than anyone else could have lived. If you pay attention to how many empires he lived through. Um, also, if you pay attention, uh, there's only one time that Daniel is of all the short stories. He's not included. It's when Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego are in the fire pit. Who's the fourth person? Seems like that person Daniel might be supposed to be representing the other stories uh, <laughs> who goes into the pit and rises again. Just saying, man, uh, it parallels the story of Joseph very well. It parallels the story of the Messiah really well, uh, even Moses to an extent. So um, I think Daniel was a Christ figure for sure. Um, and, and I think the stories are really well told. I love Bell and the Dragon. My take on the Bible, uh, the Bible shouldn't be a big book. It should be like encyclopedias where they each have their own individual thing. And the book of Daniel should have an appendix that includes this. That's what I want. <laughs> yeah. Mm. All right, Joshua, Will, tell me why I'm wrong. What's your, what's your address again, Joshua? You can just make that. <laughs> I've, got, I've got this special uh, pitch that I want to give you. It's a special turkey with stuffing in it for Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> oh, All no. right. Now that I'm a heretic, uh, Pastor Will, you want to take it away? <laughs> no, I, 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 you know, that kind of biblical scholarship around Daniel is, is all over the place. Yeah, Daniel is the old um, Hebrew Bible's version of Revelation, right? So it, it um, as the New Testament has the book of Revelation, it looks to the future and, and uh, what it means to think about as you know god as as sovereign and reign in the the kingdom that is to come i think daniel does that too in in a part of um the israelites in captivity and exile they're wrestling with um who is god how do we remain faithful in the midst of persecution which is what revelation is doing too with the early church so uh, that's that's what the book of daniel is doing and and yeah so this is um like you said biblical fan fiction they're building off other stories that they have heard and they're they're building on this and so um i'm gonna go ahead and get it my quick rating i give it a a, a good solid five uh for uh for trying to be like the other parts that are in the actual book of daniel uh, that share the stories better that why daniel is more faithful i my question is 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 it a real dragon or is it like bell a false idol made out of um something that he puts tar and pitch and lights it on fire and explodes it from the inside i i still i i'm i think it, there's some ambiguity there whether it's a real breathing dragon flesh and blood or whether it's an idol that um daniel blew up with a homemade bomb that's that's where i'm at so yeah yeah well i'll go ahead and do my rating too then um and then I, i'm gonna have to get off shortly so i'll also go ahead and give my rating for the next pick but um bell and the dragon maybe the bible um i i really like the story on, on its own i'd still give it a five you know it's pretty average for a short story. I'd give a lot of the other stories of Daniel a five as well. If I'm just taking of them as stories. Um, but since I didn't think any of this happened, literally, uh, I prefer it being a dragon. Uh, so I'm going to give two ratings. If it was meant to be an actual dragon, it's a five and a half for having a dragon. If it's not an actual dragon, it's a four and a half for not having a dragon. That's my rate. Yeah, I think that's not a big enough difference. No. Eh, you know, I like dragons. <laughs> I don't love dragons. Yeah, but like real oh. life dragon. I know. Love me some dragons. <laughs> All right, DJ, wow. what's your take? <laughs> also a five. I'm not in love with the story of Bell and the Dragon. Uh, it's cool. I like it. Uh, it shows that Daniel is, is wise and clever. That's just seems redundant. I know those things about Daniel. Yeah. The reason why I didn't make the cut in the, the canon. Yeah. That's right. Although. Maybe it was written first on the other one. And the literary know. structure is not. We don't know. I don't, I don't love that critique. Uh, you know. Yeah, yeah, same. Arbitrary. Um, yes, whatever. Christian, Christian. 
Bless your rate. Yeah, I'm dying. Uh, man, I thought I was going to be so harsh giving this a seven out of ten, but apparently I'm not harsh enough. <laughs> there you go. That's, that's yeah. my, you, know, you know, as someone's first fan fiction outing, you know, you know, I would encourage them like read the source material more. You'll learn the characters better. Like next time around, this could be a ten out of ten, but like this is your first draft. It's okay. Nice. This this could be source material. You know, I'll still maintain that. Uh, anyway, yeah. moving on. Um, <laughs> I'm going to have to leave, but our next pick was TJ's pick. So he's going to tell you why he chose it, give you a summary and everything in a little bit. Um, the story here is All Tomorrows by C.M. Kozman. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and give my rating. I, I'd give it an 8 out of 10. I, I love this. Definitely better than your average short story for me. Um, it was a little too long for me. And uh, the only reason it doesn't get higher is I don't like I'm big brain enough for this story. I was like, mm, I feel like I need to be smarter to get this story better. So that's just me. I might not be smart enough for the story, but I don't know. Can't wait to hear what short you guys stories? say later. You're dummy for short stories. Is that what you are? Another podcast? <laughs> I'm too, I'm too dumb for short stories. It, it, it would be um, too dumb for short stories. Joshua, who's going to cut this off when you leave? Like, I can't cut it off. Well, hopefully we're, well, now all of this is on YouTube. So I apologize to our YouTube listeners. <laughs> Okay. Um, <laughs> but, you know, whoever wants to, it doesn't matter. I, I think I can still end the recording even if he leaves. Mm, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Just a little business right. for people. Here. That's how podcasts are made, folks. Real people. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> All right. See you guys. See you, Joshua. Yeah. So, real quick before we go on, uh, Will, what did you rate Bell and the Dragon? Uh, five. Five. Wow. Yeah, I'm just doing all the math so we can get a, a total at the end. Uh, but all <laughs> tomorrow's by CM Kozman. I have. Yeah known this story for a long time i think i read this yeah. now that i'm thinking about it looking back i think i just read a lot of short stories in like ninth and tenth grade seems like because that's around the time that i read this too and uh you know a sound of thunder and uh all in a all summer in a day a bunch of other yeah. short stories that i love that we're not talking about but this one uh stuck with me i think better than a sound of thunder probably just as good as mm -hmm. all summer in a day because that one is Man, I actually had to read that one for a class, which was great. But he's back. He's turns back. out I didn't Whoa. have to go. Uh, okay, oh my gosh. there you go, Buck. <laughs> this is the example of all right, bye, and you walk the same direction. Yeah. All right. I feel like I'm reading another story of the of Daniel. He was gone, yeah. but now he's back. Oh gosh. I thought he burned up Somehow Daniel returned. Somehow Daniel returned. Please continue. <laughs> Yeah. So this is since, an editing nightmare. Since I was young, I've always looked uh, to the sky and to the ground with equal wonder because I wanted to know what existed before and I want to know what exists out there. And All Tomorrow's is kind of both. Uh, All Tomorrow's brings us through. It is speculative evolutionary fiction, existential mm -hmm. horror. You know, I think that's fair to say. Um, yeah. It is probably a little long for a short story, but it's not too long to be a short story. I don't think. <laughs> I don't know what defines a short story, so I can't say. Google told me 50 pages. I don't know. It's 50 pages Google's of words doesn't know everything. and 50 pages of illustrations. True. Mm -hmm. That counts. They're pretty pictures. That counts. Pretty so is 100 a page. <laughs> no. Uh, but All Tomorrow's brings us through uh, basically human history and human future it walks us through nuclear war armament we move to mars colonize it we evolve ourselves we splice the genome like has been talked about for decades uh, to develop people who can live on mars this of course means that people are now different and one thing that people hate is things that are different so mm. naturally global war billions killed we decide to reconcile that by once again splicing the genome and making the star people. And then it's like a, a couple million years of humans ruling the galaxy, doing whatever they want with the genome and DNA and colonizing the, all the planets they can get their hands on. And then the big bad coup show up. I call them the coup or the Q. I'm not sure how it's supposed to be pronounced, but uh, basically, yeah, the QU. They show up and they're like, hey, you're all idiots. That's our job. And they <laughs> take all of the humans and do basically what they were doing to themselves, but they turn them into grotesque 
in hideous monsters in what speculatively realistic ways. That's why this is speculative evolutionary fiction. And they just, whatever planet they were colonizing, is like, nope, you are now people who are carpet. You, you not, your only purpose now is to make music and be horny forever. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> basically, we get to see human extinction. And then some of the humans evolve past that point. Some of them are able to regain their sentience. Some of them remain sentient, but docile. It is an extremely interesting book. I couldn't possibly go over all of the different types of humans that they created. Not because it's long, just because there are like 40 of them. Because they each get like one page uh, and an illustration. So if you're a big fan of speculative evolution or sci-fi horror body horror uh check this out for sure ah christian's clone has joined us <laughs> yeah sorry having technical difficulties in my end so i'm sorry Even if there's an echo too splicing he just Fun. splice christian, <laughs> Damn, uh, christian splicing uh no <laughs> some of like the the what people looked like parts not the story or the speculative evolution stuff but just what people looked like parts reminded me of um how C.S. Lewis described different creatures on different planets. You know, mind you, he wrote that before space travel was possible, and it was all fantasy, not at all based in sci-fi, like science at all. It was just fantasy and space. So this one, it was interesting that it kind of reminded me of the same thing, but with more actual science behind it as opposed to speculative. Or I guess it's still speculative, but, you know, C.S. Lewis was more speculative because he was like, let's say Mars has less gravity. Things look like this now. <laughs> I was like, all right, sure. <laughs> yep. yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like John Cotter of Mars. Like, you know, when they were writing those mm -hmm. those stories, it's like it, it was before Superman. But you start talking, thinking about what 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 it would be like on another planet in terms of gravity and what you could do or couldn't do. And what would your strength be like? Same way with the moon before we got to the moon. But I yeah, I man, I love this, too. Christian and um, our TJ and and the fact that you recommended this and found I had no idea this was even out there in the world. So you introducing this to me is is amazing that I just now discovered this because I love science fiction. I love science. I love asking the big theological and ethical questions that come to with humanity. Um, and, and this has it all in, in one. So in terms of, of not just astrobiology and what it could look like on other planets if they evolved over millions of years, but also what would happen with technology and our emergence with technology and, and machines and what people do. What, and, and the question that it asks is, is it not just like humanity, but what makes one human? So like, yeah, humanity was extinct but there's still humans around mm -hmm. or the other way around or they killed all humans but they still didn't get rid of humanity v vice versa i'm not quite sure uh but but anyway like yeah what makes a person what makes a human even if it it's not just that two arms two legs a brain and two eyes two two ears like the consciousness the asking the questions what's the purpose not just am i here just to breed and create more humans or and eat and and scratch itches and you know whatever or is it or are there deeper things that I'm a part of the universe about? And that, it goes in different species and animals about this. And it was absolutely fascinating. So I found this guy's YouTube page and started following it. And also him talking about this book um, with people asking questions and went down that rabbit hole last night. Um, this dude is, man, um, a fascinating individual for, yeah. for sure. Yeah. 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 It's um, it, it reminds me a lot of the, the, you know, the philosophical problem of where does the mountain begin? You know, mm -hmm. like, is this the hill? Is this That's the mountain? Awesome. Is this the plane? Is this the, yeah. Um, that philosoph philosophical problem paired with our theology, our philosophies of what does it mean to be human? And it's just very fascinating because um, looking at it in the future is a very unique thing. But it, it caused me to go back as someone who believes mostly in evolution. I'm not 100 percent. But, you know, I'm thinking of, um, oh, yeah, that at some point there were Neanderthals. There were these things that were maybe we'd call subhuman or did they have souls how did they relate to god how did these other species of human before we were human relate to the divine and i'm like oh this is wild also a uh, quick plug um uh, i can't remember his first name raise aslan yeah he writes a book called god and goes through the history of how humans thought of god and depicted them in cave paintings and stuff really fascinating stuff yeah and and the whole question of like what if mankind 
ran into equals or others who are superior out in the galaxy universe. And so that's definitely a relevant question we're thinking about now. Yes, yeah, one thing to run across like a planet that has like water and plants on it and like um, animals or, or small microscopic organisms. But what if we run into something that has, um, you know, equal to us or superior when it comes to thought, technology, science, and, and what does that look like for us? So this, this book, short story, graphic novel, uh, which I will call it because it has pictures <laughs> and, and words yeah. <laughs> um, to, um, to, to ask those questions. So, so yeah, it's um yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for I'm, recommending. That. I'm interested to hear more of a Christian's thought The the one we know who hate read this going evolution is not real. <laughs> <the whole time. laughs> I'm joking. I know, I know you didn't do that, but I, I am interested in your thoughts as someone who doesn't buy as much into evolution as the rest of us here do. Yeah. Which um, some of us don't buy that much into it. You know. <laughs> I, I thoroughly enjoyed this. This was essentially like from you know, H.T. Wells to Time Machine. There's that section where he goes to the future with the Morlocks and the Eloy. And that's where humanity has gone in that point in time just to evolve. Into, mm -hmm. This is like an expanded version of that. We get multiple opportunities mm -hmm. to see where if this had happened, if this alien race invades, or if we modify ourselves to look way different and be different in this environment, like what will happen? I enjoyed the speculation part of that. Now, obviously, I don't agree with how it goes on and all that. But, you know, species changing from species, but you know, that is what it is. As far as the story is concerned, well told, well maintained, like the pictures are amazing. Like the and I'm not a body horror kind of person, but like seeing the way that changes in the different photos, like I appreciate the art that goes into making that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, the art was incredible. Um, OK, real quick, before we do ratings, nah, I'm glad I came back for this. Christian, uh, zero to 100 percent. Just give us a percentage. How certain are you that evolution is, did not occur macro evolution? <laughs> okay, that, thank you for clarifying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, macro, uh, I'd probably go 99.999%. Yeah, yeah. So mind you, I'm, I'm doing this because this is also for whole church. I just want to show people how Christians who disagree on some of this can actually work together. So uh, TJ, how sure are you that evolution did happen? Macro One evolution. 100. 1%. 100% uh, 100 that macro evolution did happen. Okay, yeah. I'm like 75% sure macro evolution happened. I give myself a lot of leeway to be wrong. I'm very humble about it. Like, eh, you know, I'm not a scientist. It's always humble um, when you mention how humble you are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, in so the most Joshua, humble, you'll say um, that you're not a scientist and have studied that evolution, this, yeah. but you're 75% sure it's positive. <laughs> yeah. Just from the things I have seen, it seems fairly certain, but I also am able to know my own limitations to say, ah, I won't say I'm certain on this because I don't understand all of the scientific writing. So maybe it's wrong. I don't know. Um, no, there are a lot of smarter people than me who don't believe in it. So it seems arrogant from to me. It would feel arrogant to say I'm 100 percent when people sure. that I respect that are smarter than me don't agree with me. But that's just yeah, I'll, um, I'm in I'm in TJ's camp. And and I would say that, like, uh, also in terms of how, you know, the broad spectrum of whole church and where we are and, and things like uh, the, um the, the president of my church council is an evolutionary biologist at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and and can go to him. So he's a person of faith and full on board, 110 um, percent um, believer in evolution. But the, when you talk about believing in evolution, the same way as like you would talk about, like, do you believe in God? Well, describe God first and I'll tell you if I believe in that God or not. So if so you go to went to David and said, do you believe in evolution? He would say, well, what do you mean by evolution? And, 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 to, and to tease that out a little bit and some of the nuances that goes with how you define that term is pretty important when it comes to whether you believe in something or if it's some, they, he definitely knows there's more to learn and we're learning all the time. So what we know now about science and how things evolved or mm -hmm. not, um, it, it could be there, there could be more to learn and different ways to look at it a uh, uh, hundred years or a thousand years from now. Yeah. And I mm -hmm. think all of us here agree though, that um, it's not a tier one thing. We can disagree on this. Love one another, still be Christian, right? We'd all agree on that. Well, only yes. one of us is Christian. No, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I only just one think of it was be Christian. Actually, only <laughs> one of us can be will the thrill, but all of us. Yes. Can be and, yeah. 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 But if you want to hear more of the uh, different perspectives and stuff on that specific topic of evolution and age of the earth, all that, um, both dummy for theology and Let nothing move you have recently touched on those things. So check out those other podcasts in the Amazon ministry podcast and network, but let's go ahead. I did my rating. Will zero to 10. Where are you at? Uh, 10. Fantastic. All right. Uh, TJ. 
10. This is my favorite short story. That yeah, that's fair. Also, also for fans of Dune, I have to put it out there. There is all tomorrow's does have its own computer jihad. Mm. <laughs> mm. True. Christian. Uh nine five. I really enjoyed this one. Wow. Yeah, this one, this one, uh, I'm glad we did this last. This is a good finale. Um, although if you want a follow up only on the YouTube page for systematic ecology, they might be doing it live this Sunday. I'm not sure, which means it might have gone live already. Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> but it is on the YouTube page and it will only be on that YouTube page for systematic ecology. So go over there to check out the follow up short story. They're going to be talking all summers in a day. Did I get it right this time? Maybe no, you did not. <laughs> all summers in a day. I did. Oh, oh I added an S. Eh, you know, whatever. Um, final question before we move on. Do y'all think short stories tend to be more reflective of our own time than other storytelling medias? Just like in general. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think it depends what you mean. Um, I think literature in general, maybe this is true of. Yeah. I think a lot of times our movies and stuff try to be timeless. So they're less mindful of our time, if that makes sense. Like I think Avengers is pretty intentional of not including anything that would attach it to a certain period of time because it doesn't want to age poorly. It wants to age well. Or I think a lot of short stories, just they don't really think about that. They're just writing the story that they want to tell without necessarily caring whether or not it ages well, if that makes sense. Yeah. DJ, what's your take? Uh, I think short stories have like the, you know the trademark ambiguity that most short stories do have which allows you to be more reflective of your own time because it's forcing you to yes uh anybody else do we have i a... think I, i'll agree with you that literature as a whole is a bit better on this idea of encapsulating like what, what's going on at that time yeah yeah, yeah. Especially uh, whoever wrote the short stories of Daniel that were all fan fics. Um, <laughs> sorry, I can't help myself. I apologize, guys. I'm delivering uh, two turkeys. I'm trying to disagree well. I, I care deeply about you, Christian. And I think that your opinion is in the main traditions for a reason. And mine's not. Also, you calling me dummy. mainstream? Remember that I'm a dummy. Um, <laughs> but uh, do we have any other thoughts as far as like all these stories go before... I know TJ is going to give us the uh, the final countdown. Does anybody have any other thoughts before he does that? No, I just think I I really appreciate the challenge to read these short stories because I, I do in terms of my story consumption, uh, mostly movies. I'll, I'll read a novel every now and then, uh, theological books that my friends write and, and other things or, uh, or kind of movies. But I I, I think short stories I, I, these these digests of short stories. Um, I'm glad that you introduced this and challenged us to me. I'm going to, I'm going to look at more. Uh, there are more yeah. short stories in the, in the book that Alyssa's story was in. There are other nebula winners in that, in that mm -hmm. um, um, book. And then uh, Ray Bradbury mm -hmm. wrote other short stories that I haven't read that the sound of the sun thunder is in. So I'm going to, I'm going to read more like, like, Oh, oh yeah. wow. Yeah. Okay. I'm just yeah. going to open Chris, up a can of words there. I, I feel really like inspired me have mentioned that, the Fisher Queen was nominated for a Nebula Award. It just didn't win. Yeah. Yeah. Right. They did win. I think their next short story did win a Nebula Award. What's um, the name of that one? Alice, Josh, do you remember? I don't remember. Okay. I shouldn't have. <laughs> but Good yeah. I, I also, since she's not in the house right now, uh, a collection of short stories that includes Alyssa Wong is possibly, you know, part of my wife's Christmas present. So. I'm hoping Ooh. she enjoys it. I always, I always have this. I have the tradition where I always get her one book she's asked for and one that I think will expand our horizons if we read. Because I just, I think that couples should challenge each other. That's just a random thing. But you know, it's Christmas time. There's y'all's Christmas present. Knowing about Christmas <laughs> presents. Um, <laughs> what's the tally, TJ? But, uh, what's the tally? Yeah, Who won yeah, the, the short well, story? Well, let me uh, let me first say, but based on what we were just saying there, um, I also think that that literacy is important. It, you know, helps you stay active longer. You know, for people who are worried about dementia, aging well, that kind of stuff. It's important to stay well read. Um, I think short stories is a way to get back into it. You know, sometimes it's hard if you haven't read in a while to just go, all right, let me pick up this novel that Christian Ashley wrote. Maybe you should read some short stories and then read Christian Ashley's novel. Christian, what's the one you would recommend of all your novels? Oh, that's not fair. Um, <laughs> I, I'd say either Lost Time or Resurrection Life as a all good right. start. So read some short stories, build up, prepare to read Christian Ashley. 
<laughs> TJ, what's our what's our count? Okay, so do we want to go from number five to number one, or do we want to just go in order? I know I'm in order. I just want to know what everyone's ratings are. <laughs> in order, the Fisher Queen clocked in at an eight point seventy five from us. Uh, okay. I averaged them mm-hmm. instead of. Oh, okay. Just, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Galatea ended up at a seven point eight seven five. So wow. Mm-hmm. Uh, where was I? Galatea. The next one was uh, Sound of of thunder uh ended up with a, an 8.37 five uh because you know we're doing point fives in here sure. that's our fault <laughs> uh bell and the dragon had a 5.5 average and all tomorrows ended up with a 9.375 okay wow. yeah I that was coming but <laughs> very glad well, yeah yeah as am I, as am I. Well, guys, with that, let's go ahead and um, call this one up. And we're going to start with, uh, we, we usually do recommendations. I think we'll still do one, but let's stick to either books or omnibus, anything like that. Um, I'm actually going to go pick mine up and show you. So if uh, TJ would start with a book recommendation, let's, sure. let's keep everybody alliterated. Alliterated? Uh, yeah, that's a word. <laughs> so it's actually I, I just want to like recommend picking up one of the Nebula Award showcases. Uh, the Fisher Queen is in 2016, mm-hmm. and the other stories in 2016 are also really good. I've been reading through a few of those, uh, but there is a Nebula Award showcase omnibus for every year since 1996, oh, yeah. 86 or 96. I almost went and got one of those. Actually, I do have one of them. I almost got a bunch of them, though. That's a yeah, strong so. recommendation. They're also cheap. Uh, my recommendation uh, is actually a, a Bible commentary that includes Bible passages. Daniel by Ernest C. Lucas. Uh, you can hear more of how Daniel parallels itself, the literary structure of the book. Um, maybe get a little more insight of what, why I think what I think and why Daniel is, in fact, a Christ figure. I... I really love the book of Daniel and studying it. Um, I think this one is very accessible to everybody, not just scholars. So I, th- I think it'd be worth anyone's read, especially if you find the bell and the dragon story interesting. Um, he doesn't include that story, but <laughs> how he handles everything will be interesting to you. If you find that story interesting. Yeah, I think I can say that confidently. Uh, will, what's your recommendation? I am going to say if you've, um, TJ and I still need to to have a discussion about this, but Patrick Roth was the name of the wind. It's one of my favorite books of all time. Uh, and mm-hmm. there's a short story, um, a, a painting to that called the lightning tree. Is that true? Um, TJ, do you know, do you remember? Um, it's called a slow regard of silent things. Slow um, regard of silent things. There it is. Yeah. yeah. It's fantastic. My screen is mirrored. Incredible. But- <laughs> yeah, yeah, and um, yeah. I, yeah, just that title. I mean, that title. Say that title again, TJ. I want to hear that. What does that title a say? Slow regard of silent things. That Man, does sound so cool. Good. That sounds really. That cool. does cool. So, so yeah, it's not quite a short story, but it's a novelette kind of thing, uh, a companion to Name of the Wind, which we have to read. It. Christian, have you ever read that book? Yes, I have. Yeah, we need to thoroughly discuss. enjoyed it. We need to discuss that at some point in the near future. Speaking of Christian, topic page, what is your recommendation? I think it's a novella. Yeah. Um, Skeleton Crew, Stephen King. These are some, if there was one short story I would have picked from his work, it would have been The Mist as kind of an example of where the writer himself failed, as he admits, as compared to the movie version, uh, as kind of like, see how he intended things versus how the movie would have done it. That's what I would have done. Like Skeleton Crew has some really good short stories in there if you want to get into King. Cool. All right. All great picks. I hope you all stay well read and ready for our book fair this year. More news on the come. Our show on Spotify, YouTube, of course. Smash that like button, subscribe button for Will. Um, and of course, we we'll also need you to do one big important thing, very important favor for us. And remember, we're all a chosen people, a geekdom of priests.